Let's ultrasound. On today's edition of Small Parts Ultrasound, we're talking thyroids. Tips, tricks, and protocol. So first let's dive into a typical thyroid ultrasound protocol. You wanna start out with a transverse overall thyroid image and you wanna take this with and without color Doppler. And next you wanna move on to the isthmus. And these images should be taken with and without an AP or height measurement of the isthmus. And next move on to the transverse right lobe of the thyroid. And you wanna take images of the superior right lobe of the thyroid, the midsection of the right thyroid, and the inferior portion of the right thyroid lobe. And for the midsection, you wanna take these images with and without height and width measurements. Next, moving on to the sagittal right thyroid. You wanna take sagittal right thyroid images of the lateral, the midsection, and the medial portion. For the midsection, you want to take these images with and without a length measurement, and also an image with color Doppler. And next, moving on to the transverse right neck. You want to take images demonstrating the largest lymph node with and without a measurement. And you can do an AP measurement, a length measurement, or measure this lymph node in three dimensions, which will all depend on the protocol of your site. And then you want to repeat all of the above for the left thyroid and the left neck. After you've completed the thyroid protocol, you want to take dual screen images. First of the transverse right and left submandibular glands, and next a dual screen image of the sagittal right and left parotid glands. And this completes the thyroid protocol. When imaging the transverse overall thyroid, you want to ensure that you have sufficient gel and also transducer pressure so that there's no dropout on the sides of the images. And you want to use a tool called virtual convex. This is the name on GE machines or any tool that will change the field of view from a rectangular to a sector shape. And this will allow you to image the entire thyroid and a rim of tissue surrounding it. Start with the highest frequency linear transducer that you have and then slightly decrease the frequency until the bottom of the thyroid is visible. And a pro tip, you must visualize the isthmus or your transverse overall thyroid image is off axis. Next, we're moving on to the transverse thyroid isthmus. And this is the section of the thyroid that connects the lobes to one another. And you wanna switch back to a rectangular field of view when you're imaging the isthmus and also decrease your depth. And you wanna center the isthmus in the middle of the image. And it's okay if the bottom edges of the thyroid are cut off because they are no longer the area of interest. It is now the isthmus. So make that the star of your image. Next, you want to take an AP or height measurement of the thyroid isthmus in the transverse plane. And you want to ensure that the trachea and the tracheal rings are not included within the measurement of the isthmus. And the white arrow in this diagram points to the trachea and right below that is a bright white hyperechoic line. That's a tracheal ring. And neither of these spaces should be included within that measurement. And you wanna ensure that you're taking a height measurement, which is going to be a vertical measurement on the image. And you wanna measure at the thickest part of the isthmus, but stay within the isthmus. Don't move too far to the side or you're no longer in the isthmus. And a pro tip, the white measurement on this diagram, this is a big no. This is outside of the isthmus, even though you're getting a bigger diameter. Here are some images of the sagittal thyroid isthmus, and this is typically not included within thyroid protocols. It's important, however, to follow the protocol of your site. Usually the sagittal thyroid isthmus is only imaged if pathology is visualized within the transverse isthmus or if it is enlarged. And it can be really tricky to find this sagittal thyroid isthmus when you're first learning the thyroid protocol. My pro tip is to find it first in the transverse plane and then turn 90 degrees perpendicular on it. Now we're moving on to the transverse right thyroid lobe. 
And for this, you must see the isthmus when you're imaging the transverse thyroid lobes or your images off axis. And you wanna ensure that your thyroid lobe has even brightness from top to bottom. You also want to center the lobe in the image with the bottom of the lobe located about three quarters of the way down the image and use multiple foci, typically two for a thyroid study, with the lowest foci placed at the bottom edge of the thyroid lobe. When measuring the transverse right thyroid, you want to perform two measurements, a width measurement, which is going to be a horizontal measurement, and an AP or height measurement, which is gonna be a vertical measurement. You wanna be sure also to not apply too much transducer pressure, or the transverse thyroid is gonna be compressed, which is gonna underestimate the height and overestimate the width measurement. You wanna ensure that you're on access and that you can visualize the isthmus. And also you wanna ensure that your height measurement does not include the isthmus within the height measurement. Next, it's time to document the transverse right thyroid superior and inferior poles. And for the transverse superior right thyroid lobe, you wanna center the lobe in the middle of the image and angle the probe upwards to the superior portion of the lobe. And the isthmus will generally not be in the image. If you do see the isthmus, generally you aren't angled up high enough. For the transverse inferior right thyroid lobe, you wanna center the lobe in the middle of the image and then angle the probe downwards. This shows the inferior portion of the lobe. And the isthmus will be in the image and is usually thicker in the inferior region than it is for the middle segment. Now we're moving on to the sagittal right thyroid lobe. And for this sagittal right thyroid, you wanna elongate the right lobe as much as possible. It's extremely easy to shorten the thyroid in the sagittal plane. It should be thickest in the middle and then taper smaller along the ends. And for this sagittal right thyroid, it's crucial that you change the field of view to a sector shape so that the entire sagittal lobe will fit within the image. And also when you're using color Doppler in this sagittal plane, you also wanna change the color Doppler box to a sector shaped box. So here's a side-by-side -side comparison demonstrating how easy it is to shorten the sagittal right or left thyroid lobes. The image on the top left is an example of an elongated sagittal thyroid lobe, and this is measuring about five centimeters. The sagittal lobe should be thickest in the middle and taper at the ends. The image on the top right is measuring only about three centimeters, and this is an example of an artificially shortened thyroid lobe, and this is actually the exact same thyroid as in the upper left image. This thyroid lobe is the correct shape. It's thickest in the middle and tapers towards the ends. But in an adult, under four centimeters is generally too small for a thyroid lobe. So if you're getting less than four centimeters, try your hardest to make it bigger because you're probably shortening it. Next, it's time to image the medial and lateral segments of the sagittal lobe. For the medial sagittal right thyroid lobe, you wanna find the mid sagittal lobe and then angle to the left towards the middle of the patient's body. And the thyroid lobe is either gonna get thicker in shape or skinnier in shape for a medial slice. For the lateral sagittal right thyroid lobe, find the mid sagittal lobe and then angle right towards the outside of the patient's body. The thyroid lobe is either gonna be thicker in shape or skinnier in shape for a lateral slice. Everyone's lateral and medial slices are a little bit different, which is why there's variation in how thick or thin they are. The important thing is to ensure that you are angling the correct direction away from the midline of the sagittal plane. Next, it's time to image the right neck. You want to evaluate all the lymph nodes on the right side of the neck. If they all look normal, and this means that they've got a thin hypoechoic outer cortex and a hyperechoic fatty central hilum, and they're not enlarged, then document one of the largest normal lymph nodes. And you want to label this image right neck. You do not want to put LN, which stands for lymph node, like in the images above. This is a demonstration of what not to do. 
Moving on to the transverse left thyroid lobe. And this is the mid segment of that transverse left lobe. And for this transverse left thyroid lobe mid, it's crucial that the isthmus is visualized, connecting to the left lobe of the thyroid, or the image is off axis. And for this transverse left thyroid lobe mid, you want to use a linear or rectangular shaped field of view and decrease the size of the color box to include only the left thyroid lobe and a rim of surrounding tissue. When scanning the transverse left thyroid, it's essential that the trachea and the esophagus are not mistaken for pathology or included within the left thyroid lobe measurements. And when we're measuring the transverse left thyroid lobe, you want to exclude the isthmus from the AP measurement. This is the vertical measurement. And then the second measurement is going to be a horizontal measurement, which is the width. And this can be measured from the tracheal border to the CCA border. Next, it's time to image the transverse left thyroid superior and inferior poles. Generally, when imaging the superior poles of the transverse thyroid, you're not going to visualize much isthmus. And if you see a lot of the isthmus, generally, you haven't angled up superiorly enough. However, some people have a very small superior section, such as in this case. If I had angled up any more superior in this case to get rid of the isthmus within the image, I would almost be completely out of the thyroid lobe. So use discretion. Try to get up high enough where you're not showing much of the isthmus, but gauge it based on how large that superior portion of the thyroid lobe is. For the inferior portion of the transverse left lobe of the thyroid, generally you're going to see a thicker isthmus than you will see in the mid slice of the transverse thyroid. Next, we're moving on to the sagittal left thyroid. So you wanna ensure that the sagittal left thyroid is elongated as much as possible, and you wanna ensure that you're using a sector field of view shape, and this is usually gonna be greater than four centimeters in length. And the left lobe of the thyroid is generally slightly smaller than the right lobe of the thyroid. The average length of the sagittal thyroid is four to six centimeters. However, in short and obese people, they tend to have smaller sagittal lobes, around five centimeters. And tall, slender people can have sagittal lobes that are much larger, up to seven to eight centimeters in length. So this will help you gauge if you're artifactually shortening that sagittal left lobe by gauging the height and body habitus of your patient. When we're imaging that sagittal left or right thyroid lobe, it's really easy to be off axis in this sagittal plane and make the thyroid too short. A good rule of thumb is that the average length of the thyroid is going to be four to six centimeters. So if your measurement is less than four centimeters, you are likely off axis unless you're scanning a child. Now, if you see pathology in the gland, then it's likely going to be larger than six centimeters. If you see something around three centimeters in length, generally you are off axis and shortening that gland. Also, both sides, the right and the left, should be somewhat similar in size unless pathology is present, though the right lobe tends to be slightly larger than the left. However, if you have one lobe that's six centimeters and one lobe that's four centimeters and no pathology is present, then the shorter side is likely off axis. Remember, tall, thin people can have longer thyroid lobes up to eight centimeters and short, obese patients may have shorter thyroid lobes, such as five centimeters or less. Next, it's time to image the sagittal left thyroid lateral and medial sections of the lobe. So you want to find the sagittal mid thyroid and then angle laterally and have the patient angle their head back to elongate the neck region when you're imaging the sagittal thyroid. This will help ensure that you have good transducer contact with the skin and you don't experience any image dropout along the sides of the image. And next, you want to find the sagittal mid thyroid again and then angle medially and ensure firm transducer contact to avoid image dropout on the sides of the image. Now moving on to the transverse left neck. 
you want to evaluate the left neck lymph nodes and if they all look normal meaning the fatty hilum is preserved and there's not a thickened outer cortex then you want to document one of the largest normal lymph nodes and you want to label the image left neck you don't want to put lymph node like in the images above and the measurements that you take for this lymph node are going to depend on the protocol of your site some sites measure the lymph node in all three dimensions for some sites they care mostly about the ap dimension of the lymph node and other sites care about the length of the lymph node so follow the protocol of your site as far as measuring the neck lymph node probably the most common measurement is going to either be all three measurements or the ap measurement Next, it's time to move on to the submandibular glands. And you want to image these in the transverse plane. And you find them by moving the transducer in a transverse plane to under the chin and then just sliding slightly lateral. You want to use the dual screen ultrasound control to image the right sided submandibular gland on one side of the image and the left submandibular gland on the other side of the image. And a pro tip, if you angle up too high, angle upwards towards the tongue, the submandibular gland borders will be hazy and ill-defined. And you can see this on the left submandibular gland shown by the white arrow. However, if you angle slightly lower, you're gonna get the best visualization of the borders. And this is shown on the right submandibular gland with the red arrow. Next, it's time to move on to the sagittal parotid glands. And you're gonna find these in front of the ear and just slightly inferior. And you wanna use the dual screen ultrasound control to image the right parotid gland on one side of the image and the left parotid gland on the other side of the image. And the parotid gland is best imaged in the sagittal plane. And a pro tip, often the parotid glands are pretty fatty, almost like a fatty liver is on ultrasound, meaning it's really tough for the sound waves to penetrate through them. In these cases, you wanna use a lower frequency and increase the depth to ensure that you're visualizing the lower borders. Also, increase the far field TGC. And also, it's very common to see lymph nodes within the parotid glands. And these are gonna look like oval to circular structures that are gonna have a hypoic outer rim and a hyperechoic inner central fatty hilum. Now let's talk about image optimization for the thyroid. To ensure that your images are on axis, the isthmus must be visible for the transverse overall thyroid image and also the transverse mid thyroid lobes. For the sagittal thyroid, the lobe should be thickest in the middle and taper towards the ends. And usually it's gonna be four centimeters or larger. Otherwise, you're probably underestimating the size of the lobe and off axis. For frequency, you wanna use the highest frequency that allows penetration all the way to the bottom of the bilateral thyroid lobes. For depth, you want the bottom edge of the thyroid to be located about three quarters of the way down the image, unless you're imaging the isthmus, in which case it's okay to decrease the depth and cut off the bottom portions of the thyroid lobes. For focal zones, you wanna generally use two focal zones with the lowest foci placed at the bottom edge of the thyroid, unless you're imaging the isthmus, and then the bottom foci should be placed at the bottom edge of the isthmus. For TGC for a thyroid exam, you want it to be set so there's equal brightness from the top of the thyroid to the bottom of the thyroid lobe. And also, you wanna pay attention to above and below the thyroid. You wanna ensure that it's not anechoic and also that it's not hyperechoic. Don't make it brighter than the actual thyroid. For the gain, you want to set the gain so that the thyroid is a medium gray color. And lastly, field of view size. The field of view size should be changed to a sector field of view shape for a transverse overall thyroid image and also for the sagittal thyroid images. And the field of view shape should be a linear rectangular shape for the isthmus and for the transverse thyroid lobe images.